this is where it gets confusing. We're on the monitor list and then we'll get on the watch list. Um, so the monitor list is just that it's monitoring. The watch list is when the shutdown um, would have to occur. And that's still just so you guys know, likely to happen sometime Saturday. Um, so. You're now streaming, Daniel. Okay, great, thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for your patience as we have worked through some of the technical uh, items uh, for today, uh, but we are here. Um, and so I will go ahead and call to order this Auburn City Council workshop, uh, economic uh, recovery workshop for July 10th. Um, I will uh, ask you if you all join me uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, States of America, of America and to the Republic for, for which it stands, stands one nation, one nation God, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. I'll just note that I'm wired in at the moment, so I was not able to stand there, but that was no sign of disrespect for the Pledge of Allegiance, just the technology for the moment. So um, just want to note that. It's uh, tough to quick. hear you, Daniel. It's it's a little tough to hear you, just to let is you this, know. Is this any better? Much better. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Again, technical uh, challenges today all around. So uh, this is a, a formal city council a special session, so I will ask the city clerk to take the roll. Councilmember Dowden Calvillo? Present. Uh, Mara? Yes, present. May Mayor Berlant? And I am here as well. We do have a quorum. Uh, we're likely to be joined uh, by our fellow council members uh, throughout the meeting. Uh, so let's go ahead and um, open up real quick to public comment. This is the time provided so that uh, any person uh, would like to speak to the council on an item that is on the agenda because of COVID-19 and several executive orders. Uh, we are accepting public comment uh, via uh, uh, email as well as telephone. Both of those were listed on the agenda when it was posted uh, several days ago. So I will ask the city clerk to see if there is any public comment for today's meeting. There is not public comment. Great, thank you. Then I will close public comment and we'll go ahead and move into our workshop. So the first item, uh, Hold on. Here, oh, Hold yeah, on. oh, go ahead, Marjorie, go ahead, only, sorry. Only because I'm not seeing it on the agenda. How, the seating that was put out for outdoor dining, that's currently still there and has it been expanded past it was a few weeks ago? I th um, Bob actually here in the next item uh, is gonna give an overview of uh, where we are and the potential for some additional uh, temporary permanent uh, additional seating. So uh, we can get into that here in just a bit. Perfect. Good. Yeah, perfect, I'll, I'll wait. Did anybody else have a comment that's not on the agenda? And we can discuss anything during our over re reports, but thanks for bringing that up, Marjorie, and we will cover that. So the first item on here is the health uh, and emergency response update. Uh, I did uh, join uh, our, uh, the other mayors uh, throughout the county uh, with our health officer and other county leaders um, to kind of discuss where we are related to COVID-19. Just a quick update on the statistics. Uh, as of today, we have hit the 1,000 mark uh, in positive cases uh, over the last several months. Uh, so there have now been 1,021 positive cases within Placer County. Most of those uh, uh, have, uh, have, um, have recovered. Uh, those stats can be found on the county's website. Um, a note really quickly about hospitalizations. There are 31 people in the hospital. Now it's important to note, uh, and this is where there's a lot of debate, uh, out of those 31 people in hospitals, uh, 16 of them are Placer County residents. Uh, the remainder mm -hmm. are from, from other counties. Uh, and as I'll discuss here in a moment about hospital capacity, uh, when the state looks at hospital capacity, they really don't care where the residents uh, are from. They're really looking at the county's overall capacity especially at a regional perspective. And so uh, we had a lot of discussions today about should that be held against us um, because many of these people are from other counties. And the bottom line is uh, it, they look at it at a regional level. They look at it over the overall capacity uh, as hospitals uh, are required uh, to um, you know, participate uh, across boundary lines to help residents uh, to ensure they have proper health care. Now, uh, out of those 31 that are in the hospital today, uh, five of those are in the ICU. Uh, just a, a quick statistic, and these are actually lower than um, they were uh, in June um, by a little bit, but the overall increase in positive cases in the past seven days is up 23%. Uh, 
uh, and over the last two weeks is up 67%. So the number of cases, uh, positive cases is going up. So the next thing we kind of dived into is the fact that we are seeing more cases and the fact that hospital usage is on the rise uh, has placed P Placer County onto the monitoring list. And the reason we're on the monitoring list, if you remember, uh, I've uh, explained in the past and, and others uh, in the county uh, have explained to the Board of Supervisors and others that when we moved to the stage two uh, and into stage three, the county had an attestation uh, with really five key measurements. And out of those key measurements, if you had multiple uh, of those that you met, uh, it could mean uh, taking a step backwards as far as reopening. So we have met the threshold of two of those. Uh, the first one is hospitalizations over 10% increase in a three-day average. Uh, so we have met that, uh, that one. The second one is having less than 20% of our ICU beds available. So those are the, the two thresholds that we went past this, uh, current, this week. Uh, and that is what put us onto the monitoring list. The other one though, that is uh, to note that we haven't met the threshold yet, but the county is watching very closely and they expect us to go over that as well, is the case, the case, positive cases per capita. Uh, the, the numbers, I, I don't quote me on here, but it's something like a hundred uh, new cases uh, per thousand. And uh, there's some percentages in there and we're just shy of that threshold, um, but not by much. Uh, I'll talk about it a little bit for the group and for those watching uh, what the monitoring list uh, will result in. Uh, but the bottom line is if you're on the monitoring list for three days in a row, yesterday was day one, they're likely to, um, to uh, count today as day two. And so if tomorrow we remain meeting those two, th two thresholds I mentioned earlier, uh, then we will be put onto the watch list. And the watch list is where it requires uh, additional uh, closures of many uh, indoor operations. So we'll save that uh, a little bit later in the agenda. Um, just wanted to update you on, on that. A couple other things related uh, to health though, uh, as it relates to testing, uh, testing uh, has been a major challenge for the county. Uh, testing is provided by the state uh, and so the, the county struggles with, with fixing this problem, but uh, they know that right now, uh, those who try to go and get uh, an appointment to be tested at one of the two county locations, uh, the backup is, is several days. And then getting test results uh, is averaging about six days. So that's almost a week from the time you wanna be tested to the time you find out whether you're positive or negative. And so the county made it very clear that that's unacceptable but they're working through the state uh, trying to uh, get those turnaround times uh, lessened. The county is exploring, yet they didn't provide any details uh, to, to me, but they are exploring additional uh, options uh, to increase testing capacity. So um, that's something to, to note. So the both locations in Rockland and up in uh, Kings Beach uh, are really working uh, and doing more tests than they are uh, capable of doing. I think they're scheduled to do something like 100 a day and they're averaging 120 to 140. So they are really um, doing more than they thought they could, but they still can't meet the, the overall demand. The county is continuing providing uh, meals uh, to seniors and at-risk residents in quarantine. That was a state program that the county has been participating in, so that continues. Uh, the county also is continuing to provide shelter for at-risk homeless residents uh, through Project Room Key, another state program. Uh, as of last night, they had 46 uh, uh, residents uh, taking opportunity and that is their capacity. So they are uh, sheltering at-risk homeless residents uh, every single night uh, through various uh, hotels and other lodging uh, options through that Project Room Key. Uh, two last items I just wanna uh, cover that they provided us. The county has 60 contract tracers, contact tracers. These are individuals when there's a positive case that work with the positive case to try to pinpoint where they may have gone and who they may have come into contact with. And while it's become a little political and a little controversial, uh, contact tracing really isn't anything new. Uh, the county and the state have had contact tracing for other communicable diseases uh, really for decades. 
So they have 60 contact tracers uh, within the county that are trained up. They are training another 40. Just to give you an idea though of the need right now, they're averaging about 20 contact tracers a day to meet the current workload. So with 60 trained up, another 40, so soon to be 100, they're really well within their means uh, for having enough uh, staff to do the contact tracing. And then just one last item that I wanted to mention, I had asked the question, you know, where are we seeing uh, the virus spread the most? And then number one location or activity that is leading to, uh, leading to the spread is family gatherings. So they, they continue to really try to uh, have uh, all of us and, and every resident uh, heed the warnings to uh, not interact with, with non-family members. And when you do have to go uh, do essential services and, and business that you uh, keep six foot distance, that you wear a face covering and take all the other proper precautions. So I asked if family gatherings is, is our number one, why are we looking at closing down other uh, economic uh, sectors, uh, specifically indoor operations like uh, restaurants that we can talk about in a, in a little bit. And uh, they really, the county doesn't have a good answer on that. Uh, you know, it's the state who's, who's making the declaration. And so I really pushed and really asked for more metrics or, or numbers that show how many of our cases are connected to the, the activities that, that they're looking at restricting so that we can better articulate one, the dangers, two, the precautions, and three, the justification for uh, those, uh, those reclosures. So, um, might have more on that, uh, and I'll, I'll take any questions, but I will talk about uh, when we get a little bit later on the agenda, uh, what reclosing could mean and when that will occur. But uh, that's the update that I received from the county. Um, I don't know if there's any questions that anybody has um, related, to, related to that. Uh, go ahead, uh, Alice. Yes, just really quickly. I appreciate that we're striving to have some kind of um, specialization taken into consideration what our what kinds of activities are, are, are spreading factors. But I, I think from the state's perspective, they're gonna probably be very hard nosed on that and basically say it's gonna be the same for everyone because it's gonna be a nightmare trying to say, okay, well, this county has you know family gatherings as their main cause. So let's limit these kinds of activities only versus, you know, it'd be great if they did and I'd like to have that local control. And you know, we're supposed to have local control, but I just being realistic, I just don't see it happening. Not not with this what's been happening in the you know so far. So but thank you for being vigilant. Maybe someday. <laughs> yeah, no, I I completely agree with you. I think that we will continue to see um, consistency, which is which is important, uh, you know, across the counties and across boundaries, but localization and really tying where we're seeing spread with making restrictions in those sectors or those areas, um, you know, to me is, is a priority, especially as we know that the closures have an economic impact and a negative one. And we realize that, um, as I know we'll talk about here in a moment, you know, there's been a lot of good progress made in those areas like restaurants, uh, you know, ensuring that people are wearing their face coverings, taking the extra precautions, putting plexiglass up, uh, you know, cash registers, things like that. And and so to, to, to be able to better gauge, are those working or are there more that we need to do before we just mm -hmm. kind of unilaterally close other areas? Um, yeah. So yeah, good point. Thank you for, for your comments. Yeah, go ahead, Sandy. Uh, yes, um, and I guess um, my question is, I thank you for that presentation. That's very informative. Um, family gatherings, I, I guess I'd like to know um, even a step further you know, the, I think a lot of family gatherings are taking place in public places. Um, I know my neighbor across the street, that's how their family came down with it. They had a family gathering in a public place. Um, and I know there are some public places that are throughout the county, not the city, that are allowing um, gatherings and, you know, usually their family and friends. So I don't know, I guess it'd be nice to know where this is occurring and maybe try and um, facilitate at least education in that regard, um, because that is a shame um, that everything has to shut down, um, you know, when, when in fact, um, it, maybe we can isolate it, because um, I, I certainly um, can understand um, the, the perspective of filling up the hospitals and that kind of thing. 
Yeah, no, uh, I will uh, mention, I don't know if this will answer your, your point um, there, Sandy, but the county will be releasing later this afternoon a, uh, a data analysis like they've been doing the last couple of weeks to really show us you know, age ranges, where, you know, uh, where these, these cases are coming. And I know they'll dive into a little bit of the, the, the family gatherings. Obviously that's very difficult because family gatherings, uh, at least you know, at home, are really hard to monitor. And I think the bottom line is that people have to understand that when people come from outside your household, they really need to be taking six foot you know, mm -hmm. precautions and wearing face coverings, regardless of if you're in the safety of your backyard. But your point about them doing them in public places, uh, I guess my only comment would be that the, the rules apply uh, when you're in public, regardless of your reason, whether it's an essential service or, or a, for lack of a better word, a gathering, you have to social distance, you have to wear a mask, um, and that's what helps prevent that, that, that transmission um, be between them. You know, and, and, and just to be in general, I know um, that I was in, invited to a gathering where, where they were checking around and, and the uh, facility um, or the premise, the, the business that was located in Auburn said that they can't allow a gathering. And then they went out of, the, in the, out of Auburn in, but within the county. And so there was a business that allowed it. Um, and I thought that, you know, I don't know if that's very fair for the businesses, but anyway. No, I mean, I, I'll leave it to, to, to our business owners to, you know, jump in. But I think that when, when some businesses kind of cut corners and, and allow those things to happen, it, it's a disadvantage to those that are following the rules. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that, that's an unfortunate piece. Rob, did you have a, a comment on that? Yeah, just a couple things um, on this same topic. I think, um, Obviously, the quality of the contact tracing is the thing, and I know that for some reason it's um, controversial, but in terms of trying to create some more autonomy, if you were going to make an argument to the state at some point, I think the quality of your ability to isolate where the things happen really would be a huge, um, I think it would be a, a huge factor, you know, if you were going to try to make a case, honestly, like how good are you at truly getting that piece? Second thing that, um, and this is kind of my, my own, and I know we'll dovetail into to outdoor dining and stuff because it continues to be a big issue to me. I would like to know how many of these, um, out of these family gatherings have a significant indoor component because I am truly a believer that um, that an outdoor gathering is is not anywhere close to the same level of of you know um, infectious uh, transmission as indoors. And if the county had that kind of data, I think it could go a long way toward really helping us understand how we can protect our businesses because so many so many businesses have done a great job on that front and. You know, if people are gathering in, in their homes or they're going to some business that's opening up a back banquet hall and there's no there's no air circulation to speak of, that's a huge difference than, you know, if you're sitting at Trey Ponce and they've got a door open and a few well-spaced, you know, uh, tables indoors and, and, and a huge outdoor component. I mean, you know, it, it, it does, re you know, I realized to Alice's point that the state the state is not in the business of trying to be that localized in their responses. But ultimately, if the data was really reliable on the ground, you know, I, I think a case could be made, you know, because I, I think it's a huge deal, indoor v. outdoor. I truly do. I, I agree 100% uh, with that as well. Bro, I, I'll, take that, um, I'll take that comment forward because I think that is a is a very good one for them to dive into a little bit more of indoor gatherings versus outdoor gatherings. Um, and I, I, I guess with the state's restriction on indoor dining, but still allowing outdoor dining, one can easily make the connection that obviously outdoor dining is, uh, you know, not as okay. much of a risk as indoor dining. So I think your point is, is very valid. Um, so I'll, I'll move forward. One thing um, too that I'll just note is um, I made a, a, a pretty big deal this afternoon with, with our county leaders that, to push back on the state to say, listen, 
why are we closing down indoor dining or zoos uh, or, or tasting rooms if we're not saying those are leading areas where the virus is being spread? And so, you know, I, I, I was given a, some narrative of how they know that's more dangerous, but I told them that I thought that it would be much easier for them and even for us, and then to act, we would actually more likely see uh, people follow it if they truly had data that said that this particular sector was of a more high risk and was truly leading to, to cases. But when we look at it and it shows public or your family gatherings being the leader, but that has nothing to do with the restrictions, it's just hard you to articulate to our residents why they need to curtail those types of gathering activities. Um, but again, it's a state, state uh, decision. And so that's where it is kind of this one size fits all and it's hard for us to kind of push back on that. But I did make a big deal about wanting more data to, that has a nexus to the closures that are occurring. Right, well, so all you can do is, you know, I don't agree with every um, outlying argument that we make on this behalf, but I certainly believe that there's a huge need to really push um, as best we can, you know, on areas that make that have to make sense. I mean, it needs to make some sense. And, you know, I think that's to your point, right? Like it's, you know, where if, if I mean, Look, I mean, we're, 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 we're seeing right now what's going to happen in the next couple of days is going to be a complete sh shutdown of outdoor athletics. And there's been some relatively rogue things going on on that front. And, um, and it's all getting shut down. And, um, and, and I'm like, there, I, I haven't seen a shred of evidence that, that there's much spread. In fact, I have an anecdotal story that will tell you that it doesn't happen in those scenarios. I mean, my son was on a baseball team that had a COVID positive player in the dugout for six hours. He was asymptomatic. They found out he had gotten it from his girlfriend. Everybody got tested. Nobody had it, including the kid that stayed in the uh, room with him overnight. His, the girl's parents didn't have it. She got it from her grandma in Arizona. Um, and my point for bringing this up is, again, it continues to speak to this idea of asymptomatic outdoor scenarios are different than indoor scenarios with 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 non-asymptomatic and, and asymptomatic matters if you're singing and protecting yada yada. But again, indoor v outdoor is just a big deal to me. And Daniel, last thing I have to say is, yeah, I think I think we should put a lot of. I mean, we can talk all day of whether it's right or wrong, but. To me, we live in an area that fortunately we can have an opportunity to have a lot of outdoor dining for many hours throughout the day and night. And um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing what we're doing to facilitate the um, expanse, expansion of the outdoor dining opportunities. Cause I, I agree wholeheartedly outdoor is much different than indoor. So anyway. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a good segue. Does anybody else have any questions or comments on this item uh, before we move on to talking about just that? Okay, seeing none, uh, let's move to then the city actions and services. And Bob, I'll let you, uh, you know, explain a little bit more of what the city is doing, but then uh, talk to about the uh, outdoor dining components. And you're on mute, Bob. Thank you. That is in fact, a lot of what we've been working on. Uh, it's funny how things have changed since the beginning of COVID when most of our work was helping to educate businesses as to what they needed to do, prepare for, et cetera. Uh, over the last two weeks, the business associations and individual businesses, they've all been seeing that in fact, um, we're getting closer and closer to getting to the watch list and wanted to start working proactively with the city on getting things ready. So it, it has been obviously the, the restaurants and the bars that have been uh, most active, uh, anticipating that they would be most uh, most impacted. Um, so what we've been doing, working through the business association, is really looking at creating better and larger outdoor dining with a more permanent feel to it. Uh, it's really, we're not looking for super long term at this point in time, but maybe looking out six months or, or two months or so, and then reevaluating. Um, as an example, Old Town is looking at shutting down 
a portion of Washington Street from in front of the, uh, the arts co-op uh, up to the triangle area. Uh, they would need, what we've really discussed is we need to create these, these new outdoor dining areas as amenities. Something that is attractive doesn't look like it's just been thrown together. And so what's the quality of the fencing that we need to put in the, the mm -hmm. furniture and fixtures? Uh, how are we gonna maintain this on a daily basis? How do we keep everything clean, everything sanitized? And then how do we secure those sites? How do we secure the mm -hmm. furniture that's in there? Do we move it in and out? Where does it go? Uh, who actually provides those services? Do we chain things together? All those discussions are going on with, with both, both associations. Um, right now, what we're talking about is a 60 day um, ability to create these, um, these outdoor dining opportunities or seven days after release of the requirement, whichever is less. And so those permits are, are fundamentally ready to go once we receive uh, the, the written uh, requests from each of the associations. Uh, Old Town also, I'll just continue using them as a, uh, an example. They're also looking at opening up Herschel Young Park and making that request. They would be open to for uh, uh, overall outdoor dining. Also, several businesses are contacting us asking, can they turn their on-site parking into on-site dining? So what we're going to see is the opportunity to have a lot more um, outdoor dining uh, to, to assist uh, both individual businesses and the global uh, businesses in the area. We'll see a lessening of uh, parking opportunity. So it's, we are looking at weighing those balances. And that's why we're actually trying to do mu much of this through the business association. So we, as a group, we can look holistically at what are the best opportunities we can create and what are the constraints that those also uh, will create and what, what's the best balance there. And so we're working those out. Uh, downtown is doing the same thing. I think what's nice with downtown, they've already made an excellent purchase of, of table chairs and umbrellas. Uh, they're looking though at, at some, um, temporary street closures on specific days and they're working out the details now and again we're just waiting to get their their paperwork request in and then we can start to uh, have the final discussions and, and issue permits um there's also some new abc requirements those are constantly changing and as well as food requirements for when this change starts to be implemented so we're trying to make sure that everybody is getting up to speed on those things and hopefully I would say within the next week, uh, we'll have things signed off and we'll, we'll be able to run this as a, a temporary program and, and see what we can do to uh, ease the burden on, on our, especially our restaurant community. With that, I think I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Bob, for that update. Uh, any questions uh, for anybody? I do, just Bob, yeah, are we go having ahead. a, a large response from the from the dining establishments in Old Town and downtown to want to expand to outdoor dining because I know we kind of talked a little bit about how some of them were concerned about the cost and effort to move outside. Yeah, the um, uh, the the real push came in their internal meetings, and so the presidents uh, came initially to meet, and we all sat down. You know, I think this go round now they're seeing another internal shutdown, in, in, inside shutdown, that really is gonna have a big impact. So yeah. they're going to be forced Good. to really invest time, effort, money, whatever it is, into creating um, surrogate, the, the surrogate uh, uh, dining areas that they're all going to need to share. And we're happy to help facilitate anything we can that, that is, is at all reasonable. Right now, they're working hard. Again, the things we've talked about, though, is really we have such lovely towns in the downtown and old town area. They're, they're lovely. We want to make sure that we can get the kind of fixtures in, furnishings in, that, that it doesn't look like we just slap something together mm -hmm. and have people sit down and eat. But can we create a bit of an ambiance, even in a street, that uh, will in entice people to come down, patronize our restaurants, and have a nice evening. It's a nice evening, even though it's a different venue. And you said that there were changes coming down from ABC. What kinds of changes are they? Are they trying to be a little more lax? You, you that, know, they, are we seeing? 
they were more lax and they're starting to tighten things up a little bit more. And so we're trying to get a handle on that. Uh, there's also things like, if you recall when they said they uh, allow alcohol to open up again, but it had to be with a meal. Mm-hmm. And what they were, were, they were always dancing around the fact they didn't want it to be bar food, but they wanted it to be a real meal, which is a hard thing to define, you know? You have to have meat, potatoes, and a vegetable. <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? <laughs> so now right. they're actually starting to say certain things are not food, which is simple bar food. So it's oh. those kinds of, of requirements that they're, they're starting to throw out. Chicken wings is not a meal. So you can't have chicken wings to get alcohol. My wife would argue with that, Bob. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not taking a, a position here. But in fact, so now what they're looking at is starting to cut off those kinds of uh, ways around it and saying we want real food, substantial amounts of food uh, to be able to serve alcohol. And so th- those are the kinds of shifts and changes that we're seeing going on. And we just want to make sure that everybody is aware of them, cognizant of them, and making sure everyone stays out of trouble in a really difficult environment. So would a food are, truck be- Yeah, that's, I was gonna ask about the food trucks. So is that considered substantial enough for them or? It's gonna be interesting to see. They haven't defined, I haven't at least seen it defined down to that degree where we've been doing our research right now has been far more on the side of the physical restaurant, what they can and can't do. But I will be happy to look into that and see if they have specific regs right now out there for food trucks and alcohol. Because that seems like we have, you know, facilities, wineries, well, the tasting rooms are closed, but I don't know. Any, any latitude we can have, I think is the better, so. Yeah, absolutely. So oh, Bob, that's uh, is Cro- Crooked Lanes in city limits, right? Yeah. So yes. obviously that that's fundamental piece of their business. Have as there any? How are they proceeding at this point in terms of? Because breweries were off, but then there was some talk that the food, you know, like the the variants that we had when we were starting to open up was going to apply. Has there been any clarification on that at all? We're worried that they're going to be shut down again, the breweries and the wineries. Yes. So that's that's most yeah. of our focus, I mean, most of our focus right now is on the restaurants because we think they can stay open if they're exclusively outside. Uh, but it appears as though the breweries and the wineries are going to be shut back down. Mm-hmm. Um, quick couple quick things, Bob. Uh, number one, I, my daughter um, was telling me that in Burlingame, they've actually, they actually uh, shut their main street down on the weekends. I haven't seen what that looks like, but, um, you know, for, for this kind of uh, stated purpose, obviously the Bay Area has been a little more tight than mm-hmm. some of us, but might be worth at least looking at to see how that's worked for them. I haven't seen it, but it's a thing, I guess. Um, secondly, I wanted to ask, do businesses that want to explore parking, uh, variances, uh, have to go through their business associations and, um, and I'll just specifically bring this up uh, because I was having dinner the other night at Trey Pate and they were, one of the things they kicked around was that idea of those two parking spots that are kind of funky right in front of their place. You've got to get, you know, they were like worried about all the logistics. And the one thing I said was, I said, look, I know the city is being, you know, trying to be really proactive on this. Um, so there, that might be something that they can get streamlined quicker. I don't know if that was good advice or not um, based on today. Absolutely. absolutely. Look, if we go through the business associations, I think packaging together so we can, as a group, see the totality of the impacts of all this. But with Trey Pate's, I was thinking the same thing. They have those two little errant site, uh, parking spots out there that could function very, very nicely for them. Yeah. And uh, I, I can see that certainly in the game. As far as uh, say with the Berlin game example, downtown has been talking about shutting down uh, Upper Lincoln Way uh, for one, two or three nights a week. And they're exploring that with their membership right now. You know, it's, it's one of those things where I think we envision, though, 
back in the days of having big festivals there yeah. and having these big crowded sweet streets. Now though, we have what, three restaurants, four restaurants in the whole general area there. So what you might come up with is a closed street that looks like a ghost town that it actually detracts from the attractiveness of going into the area. So how we create densities of people with what we actually have in place becomes an important part of that discussion. And April Maynard and I have kind of gone back and forth on that. It's not that we can't do it, but could it actually detract right. from the attractiveness of our restaurants? And so that's what we're trying to work through and we come up with, with strategies for that. Right. And we wouldn't want to impact the other businesses as well. You know, just we have to keep that in consideration. You know, if you are closing it and, you, and it, it, and it is, looks like a ghost town, then you're also potentially limiting access to those other businesses that might remain open. So lots and, of things to take in consideration. Well, and hey, then, uh, 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 yeah, go ahead, Sandy. Oh, oh just, just uh, getting back to the, um, I just want some clarity uh, back to the breweries and, and the, um, um wineries um for a while they were um selling you know like if you got some food from the food truck or um if you got some chips and dip then you can get a beer or i suppose a glass of wine and then go sit outside so would they be able to you know you said there's they would be thinking of shutting them down um are they going to completely shut them down or would they be able to resort back to that opportunity it it is our guess at this point in time that they're looking at shutting them down and so alcohol can only be served with full meals that's where we think we're going back to oh boy that's too bad it is and, and so if it's any different we will work with them very very rapidly but we have to see what the actual requirements are to the order when it comes out okay thank you yeah. Go ahead, Monique, did you have a question? The, the, the one last thing I wanted to say, and it's probably a longer term deal, was this, you know, I have this cockamamie idea that, you know, you take that upper Lincoln and one way it permanently, you know, um, as a potential for, for of creating a space that is not ghost towny. It's just a different thing. And I know that's not something could be done in in two months, has that Bob ever been sort of looked at? I mean, I think you could do it and lose a, a very minimal amount of parking, honestly, while opening up some um, sidewalk on both sides. I know it's a bigger public works, you know, conversation, but I don't think it'd be the same as as making it completely walking because you'd still have some flow of traffic. You'd still have parking. All the parking spaces would obviously be the same way. You know, they would, but you wouldn't have an up and a down. Is that is that just really too far out there? You know, I, I think I spoke to Bob about that as well, and so Bob can probably address that. I'm sure. You know, it, it's been discussed for years. Yeah, um, and I think we get back to almost the same discussion that we just had, and it is what is the level of density of people that that area attracts, and once you get to a point where it is just packed full of physical people not just the parking opportunities, but once you, you have amassed so many people on a consistent basis, you can start to look at that. What we don't have yet in downtown is the su su sufficient draw of those businesses to bring in lots and lots of people on an ongoing basis. That's when you can start to turn areas into plazas or semi plazas and see them succeed because the draw from the, the businesses are so strong that people will continue to come, even if they have to physically walk from further distances. Um, and that happens, it, it definitely happens in, in many locations. It, I don't think it's there yet for, for the downtown. Uh, we still have so many days and evenings still where it can be somewhat vacant of people. Yeah. And, and if we don't make it as convenient as possible during these times, we may actually hamper the success of those businesses. But there are a lot of great ways to physically do what you're talking about, uh, to extend out some sidewalk areas, plant new permanent trees, uh, to allow 
the drawing out of businesses, of restaurants, of tables and things like that permanently and make it more of a strolling plaza with still having parking and some and, and drive through. It, it certainly can physically be done. No, that's a good point. I, you wonder if there's a formula, how many restaurants per storefronts for that, something like that to work, really, you know, because there's always that question of, well, if we build it, would it be more attracting versus, you know what I mean, how it is now? But there's probably formulas, right, in your business. They're like, hey, that's worked when, when there's been X, right? And I think you can actually just physically see it. When you see such demand by the public to be in an area, then you can start to pull out. You know, it, it happened, and I'm almost shooting myself down, but it happened almost opposite with Central Square. Now, in that particular case, that was the most dusty, arid, nasty little intersection that you could think of. But we created a space there, and it drew yeah. people in. The difference, though, is we didn't mess with traffic flow. And well, maybe better, actually, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, actually, it did. So you could still get people in and out and in through that area, and parking was still very much available. And so it, it drew in better businesses and all. But by in Lincoln, up Lincoln Way, I to make those kind of physical changes that will attract people, you have to knock down traffic and parking. And I think that would hamper it at this juncture. It's good. It's a good analogy though, because it does bring up both sides of it, right? You know, because yep. that was very controversial, I remember at the time. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. You know. Yeah. I, I think uh, the good part of that suggestion is that, you know, you'd still have the parking, which I think everyone was concerned about, and you'd have traffic, maybe not as much traffic flow because it'd be going one way, um, but I, I do think uh, there definitely is a draw at Tango. In fact, people are practically falling all over themselves down there. <laughs> so it'd be nice if we could uh, somehow get a lot of those people to walk up uptown and you know go to different restaurants as well up there so but yeah your point's well taken well this is uh, some good discussion and and bob i appreciate too uh today kind of hearing the balance because i think you know media it's in my mind is let's put as many tables outdoors as we can um, but you're right i think there is definitely a, a, an important balance to ensure not just solving today's issue but making sure that those restaurants uh, are viable into the future and I know that there's going to be a lot of discussion, whether it's here at this workshop or, you know, at the city council or even you know, a special group we put together to kind of revitalize some of the uh, efforts that have already been put together to uh, expand the streetscape, um, not just for beautification, but for additional outdoor dining to make things more permanent. So maybe that's something you and I can talk about and, and we can bring to the council because I think there's Absolutely. Some, some good. And I'd be, certainly be happy to be a part of that group and help out. Um, yeah, in that absolutely. Regard. Okay. Well, uh, Bob, maybe we'll, we'll let's let's follow up on that for sure. Monique, yeah. I, I thought I saw your hand. Did you have a question? No, I didn't. Sorry. Okay, no. that's good. Okay, um, Bob. Anything else uh, on this item? Uh, not on this item. No. Okay. Great. Um, let's go ahead and move to business uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, Bob, Jackie, I know that the chamber and the city have both been working very hard to uh, issue out the tens of thousands of uh, face masks that we received and the hundreds of gallons of hand sanitizer uh, that we got. Any updates on, on those efforts? Uh, last I heard from Allison, there was still quite a bit left. I haven't been over there to check it out yet, um, but we are working with uh, Constant Contact and we'll be sending out an email next week to business owners um, just to remind them that we have it because I'm not sure that everyone um, in the business industries got our chamber emails. So I have emails that are not on our chamber email blast um, that I will be sending out to uh, next, probably on Monday to try and get more people to pick up supplies and stuff like that. Hey, Jackie, have we talked about maybe um, getting sending that information to the business associations and they can email it out also to their membership? Uh, yeah, I could. I think most of the associations are on our email blast. Um, I would hope so. Um, 
but I, I can definitely get with the different associations and get emails of their members. And, and I'm, it, it'll just go straight to, for that source and not for any other yeah. marketing stuff. It's just going straight for the PPE, PPE so. Um, Sorry, Bob, anything to add? Yeah, the city is uh, helping out with the distribution of the materials. Uh, we're open every Wednesday down in the Rose Rooms from 10 to 11. Uh, Chamber's done a great job of organizing uh, the packaging. When people order it, they come on in on a separate day. They organize it, label it for who it is. City staff then just waits for people to drive up. We, we put it in the vehicles. Um, Jackie's right. We have an awful lot left. And quite frankly, when I first looked at it, it's like 36,000 of these and 40,000 of this. And what are we going to do with it? And there's still a lot there. But I think as we're starting to see things evolve in the region, although we're gonna to have to store this for, for a while, my, my bet is we will see a, a level of demand all the way through probably New Year's. And so, um, we've, yes, we've got a lot, we still have a lot, we've distributed a lot, but I think we're going to need the, everything we've got over the next six, seven months. Yeah, I think the idea is to just make sure that all the business owners in the community know that we have it because I'm not sure that they all do. Mm -hmm. Is there anything we can do to assist you with that? I, I mean, I, I know you're going to send stuff out to the members, to the associations, but is there anything you can think of that, that we can do to, to help expand that outreach? I'm trying to work with Amy to get emails. Um, I know that um, there's a little hold back on wanting to give up emails, um, which is understandable. Um, but I'm trying to work with her to get as many emails of the businesses in the city that um, we have so that I can send it out. And then I guess, I, and then again, I can send it directly to the different organization or the different uh, uh, associations to send out to their members as well. Or, or even the city might be able to send, if, if there's some business owners that are a little conscientious or cautious about the emails, maybe we can send out some of them via the business licenses or something. You know. That's what I was going to ask, uh, Alice, is that point. And I know we, we have a pretty archaic business licensing uh, process and system, but is, is there the ability, Bob, or can we look into, do we, tr do we capture email addresses for our license holders and we could send out a blast to them? You know, actually, we're, we're out of the dark ages. We do have a good system now. Okay, okay. Uh, and we do <laughs> capture those. We capture the, the email addresses from most of our participants, but up until recently, it is always said that we would never release that that information It'd just be used for internal use but we, then we can we can then maybe just send that out instead of giving them over to the chamber maybe we can just send those out if the council is comfortable with that we'd be happy to do it you know as a public service um and it's we're, we're it's coming out from us yeah. no offense jackie at all <laughs> but you know if the goal here is to reach as many businesses as, as possible then i'm sure we're all on the same page and if it means we send out some emails and the chamber sending out emails to everyone they can, then then that's great. Hey Jackie, yeah. quick question. Quick question on that. When you so to, to to qualify, business has to go to the chamber page, fill out the little the little questionnaire, right? Mm -hmm. I think and, it's a Google Forms. I don't think it's on our website. Well, there's something on the website because we went over there. And it's possible. It it, yeah, they could have possibly put it on there, but it was a Google Forms link that we had sent out. But does there is there a confirmation or anything like that, or how does that work? Because it I could be that some. Because I know we filled it out, and I you know we haven't heard anything, and and I don't know if people are waiting to hear back or anything like that. So the I think mm, the possibility of the problem is is the email that comes. Uh, to let you know that your PPE is ready is coming from a Gmail account. And some people might not have that saved in their, mm. their, their it's inbox. Going to trash. Yeah. yeah. So um, unfortunately, when we lost our office staff, we created a Gmail account so that it was more accessible to our board because um, um. we could share the account rather than having that chamber emails. Right. Um, so that's where the emails are coming from currently is the Gmail account. Okay. Thanks. Jackie, Bob, anything else on this item? Okay, great. Thank you guys both for, for your efforts there. 
Uh, the next item here is uh, reclosing discussion. So as I mentioned at the top here, uh, we are on the monitoring list by the state. Uh, and it's very likely that sometime Saturday, uh, we will be put on the watch list. And so what does the watch list mean? It does mean that uh, you have to cease uh, all indoor operations in a number of sectors. And if you'll bear with me for one second, of course, it disappeared on me as I was going there. But that includes uh, indoor, uh, indoor dining, uh, as well as, and it's opening here, uh, zoos, uh, as well as family entertainment centers, uh, movie theaters, uh, wineries and tasting rooms, as we discussed, uh, card rooms, and then bars must close all operations. So uh, it's very likely that on Saturday that will come and whether it is uh, effective immediately uh, or how the, the timing of that will all work out is a little uh, unknown. Um, but I think that it's important that we're conveying to uh, our, our business owners that it's very likely that starting Saturday at some time uh, all indoor operations, uh, as I listed, um, will uh, be closed. Uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention is I did ask the question about, is there a stage two uh, reclosure? You know, is there another step backwards? And uh, the county said that it is, there, there's that potential that we'll actually fully move back to what was stage two of reopening. And so that could mean additional uh, uh, closures of things like personal services, et cetera. Uh, and so I really conveyed the importance that uh, one, we really have the data that shows that those are sectors that uh, are, are leading to the virus uh, spread, but also two, as much as we can uh, based on health risk, uh, have some level of uh, notification ahead of time so that uh, we can prepare those businesses for that potential. Um, so that, that I just throw that out there that, uh, this is just maybe step one of, of reclosures uh, in general. So with that, uh, does anybody else have anything uh, they have uh, factual on this or questions for anybody here or just open discussion? Alex, uh, go ahead. I was just gonna mention, what I also tell people is that since we've been going through this, uh, really Placer County is about two weeks behind Sacramento County. And so what's happening in Sacramento County is you know, if you're talking about wanting to be prepared as a business owner and you see that, you know, for example, they propose to start closing gyms, that might be an alert to Placer County gyms that that could be coming down the pipeline. It's not to say it will, and hopefully it won't, but that's a, a good indicator. You know, I kind of, we're about, you know, it's like California was a couple weeks behind New York, right? So same kind of thing with Sacramento County. I see that we're about a week to two weeks behind. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I think that's a good one. The other thing too, the county said, it's very likely that uh, the counties above us will be added to this watch list, uh, be above us being geographically, will be added yeah. to the watch list not far behind us. Obviously, El Dorado and Nevada County have some similarities to us and they not are not yet on the watch list, but um, you know, we'll likely see all of those uh, follow suit. Uh, questions, comments uh, by the, the rest about the additional reclosures? Uh, so one thing to note uh, on the stats earlier, when we only, you know, we only have five COVID patients in ICU, um, but capacity is related to every person in ICU. So it's really well worth noting that, that is in the eyes of the state, as far as ICU um, readiness, um, they don't distinguish between whether it's a COVID patient mm -hmm. or somebody heart attack, whatever. So it, that can be confusing because you look down and you're like, geez, we got five cases. What do we only have seven beds? But it's not, you know, they, they capacity is capacity. That's you know, right. Yeah, good point, Rob. Thank you for that. Um, to the business leaders, uh, you know, any issue that you guys, I mean, besides the issue at hand, any major, uh, you know, additional items that you see in, in this, uh, you know, potential announcement tomorrow? I don't know. I, I, I would look forward to the, the city sending out the emails to the business owners. I know out here at the business park, I don't have all those. And so that's great that you guys will contact them with the ability to get the, uh, the stuff the chamber has. 
that. Yeah, absolutely. Anybody else have anything on uh, the, this potential uh, recloser? So again, we'll, we'll post that as soon as that information becomes available. Uh, and uh, the big question, the million dollar question is, is it effective immediately? Uh, and so if at 9 a.m. the email comes out, does that mean at 9 a.m. indoor operations must cease? I think that's gonna be um, an interesting interpretation, but I think the bottom line is our, res our business owners need to be prepared um, that at some point tomorrow, it's likely that that, that will come down and how quickly uh, people follow suit um, will be probably left up to the business owner based on whatever direction we get. I think, Daniel, on that end, if, if we're placed on the list on Saturday, then I think that, you know, that that means Sunday, everything needs to be closed down. I can't imagine, because who knows what time, you know, I mean, are they going to the come with a big hammer and hit us on the head because we're still serving dinner Saturday night, you know, to me, you know, Sunday. No, I mean, I think it's very valid. Um, we, myself and the other mayors really pushed on, on that and really didn't get a get a good answer because you're right, it's mm. really not very feasible to say 9 a.m. the state <laughs> alerts the county. Well, how's the county gonna alert all those restaurants and businesses? Yeah. Again, it's our job right now to put everybody on alert. Um, but you know, the the realism there is is that will be a challenge. Yeah. So. And as long as we got some extra PPE, maybe we could send a couple of complimentary boxes up there to the poor choice. To let them uh, <laughs> come around. <laughs> I don't want to weigh into that, but uh, you know, uh, it's an interesting world. I'll just leave that there. Thanks, Rob. Uh, <laughs> we'll move on to uh, the next item. Uh, this is Auburn Chamber of Commerce report. So, uh, Jackie, uh, welcome. Thanks for representing the chamber today. Yeah, I don't have much to report on other than uh, trying to get the PPP out or PPE out, PPP and PPE, too many letters. Um, and we're just working hard to try to assist our businesses as much as possible. Luckily, we do have one of our staff members back uh, part-time. So we're not answering the phones uh, while kids are running around screaming uh, as board members tend to do since we're working from home. Um, we hope, uh, Keith is coming back soon. Um, as of right now, he's out through August from his doctor. Um, and other than that, we're just kind of chugging along. Great, thanks Jackie. And obviously, yeah. you know, our best to Keith and hopefully he gets back on his feet uh, um, very soon. And, and I know you, Allison, and many others have been working to keep uh, not only your families in line and your businesses in line, but the chamber uh, keeping it moving. So thank you for that. Yes. Um, we'll go move on to the business associations. And so uh, we'll start with uh, Marjorie for the airport uh, business park. <laughs> Nothing new. We've had no meetings. So no, no. I see that the, the two tap rooms, Moonraker and, and Knee Deep are still having events and food trucks and going strong. And it uh, looks like most people here are open, although with limited staff. So except for across the street, which is the um, the airway thermal and there there's hiring so yeah it looks good out here great yeah no it's a good opportunity for anybody who's unemployed or looking for a job so yeah. thank you for that uh, looks like Monique might have stepped away she did so uh, well uh, with that um, we'll just I'll open up see if there's anything uh, good of the order roundtable uh, before we conclude the meeting. Actually, Rob, I didn't give you an opportunity. Anything from uh, from Visit Placer you want to report on? Well, go. I mean, you know, right now the travel is again. We're back to you know heavy breaks on the messaging. All of our messaging right now is about safety and travel. You know, coming out here, being respectful, travel responsibly. We have a new page up uh, that really directs people about how to. You know, interact i mean folks are coming you know so we just really want their our messaging is is completely about come here be respectful be safe enjoy it you know but but do so in a in in a respectful manner um across the country uh resident confidence has never been lower uh in terms of of wanting visitors uh 
uh, four and a half times more residents prefer people don't come. That's a reality. People are coming anyway. And that's why I think it's super important that we really, you know, we really lead by example. And, you know, I know earlier I, you know, I brought up that situation, but it's super important, I think, that we are really leaders on this thing because the sentiment is real, whether people want to admit it or not. And so the more we the, lean into that messaging, the better for all of us. Um, you know, people have travelers have a lower um, confidence that they'll be doing more in the fall than they did at any other time. So right now we're just in a we're in a really really tough messaging time, and um, you know, which is again why you know you'll you'll hear me pounding the drum beat. You know, let's apply, let's let's appeal to the least the least um, um, overt or the, the the least confident traveler should be the person that we really are trying to talk to as most of them are right now. Great, thank you for that, Rob. Uh, Monique, uh, anything from the 49er Business Association? No, we don't have any updates. We're just continuing to be that um, education and support for the businesses that are have any challenges or anything like that. And I, Rob, I appreciate that message because that's really true of the confidence level is is definitely down on people that are wanting to travel. And it's kind of, it's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon. And again, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of good information, a lot of good discussion. Obviously, we'll continue to follow up on some of the PPE notifications to our license holders, uh, some of the, the more permanent outdoor dining, uh, and then again, notification uh, if tomorrow we do get added to the watch list and have the indoor operations uh, closed. So in the interim, though, uh, if something comes up, please, uh, you know, let us know and we will be happy to, uh, you know, uh, continue to, to work on whatever issue. Uh, comes uh, in front of us. So with that, um, I will Daniel, go ahead, Alice, will, yeah. will we, yes, will we meet next Friday or is it still on the uh, every yeah. other week? So, um, you know, last month I had said that we could go into another every other week. Um, let me ask you guys, uh, specifically the business associations, you know, with some changes coming here right mm -hmm. now, uh, do we want to meet again next week? Do we want to just stay fluid or do we want to you know, stay with the every other week uh, meeting? You know, Mr. Mayor, if I may? Yeah. Um, at least from my perspective, I know the next two weeks are going to be quite busy. And there could be some controversy and strain in the changes we're making, creating new spaces for businesses, eliminating parking for others. It might be a good opportunity to have it every week as we get over this next transition. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, would I, agree. I would agree. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah yep. with that, and, you know, Obviously, this is a special session, so we really have the ability to call a meeting uh, pretty darn quickly. Um, so if, if something comes up even sooner than that, uh, you know, we're happy to, to do that. But we'll go ahead and plan then to, uh, to get back together this uh, coming Friday then. So great. Um, again, thank all you right. all very much. Uh, and I'll go ahead and uh, conclude the meeting. Yes, have a Thanks, safe everyone. weekend, everyone. Please remember, wear your masks. Stay yes. six feet apart. Hey, all the you. Are required to do. Wash your hands. Thank you. Goodbye. Wash your hands. See ya. Thank you. Bye. Bye.